Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us um, during this webinar on SDG3. Health and well-being are often central to the work activists and organizations focus on trans and gender diverse individuals. But how does this tie to the sustainable development goals, specifically to SDG3, good health and well-being? During this webinar, we will have conversations with Liesl Terron and some invited panelists to discuss what is the emphasis of SDG3, how activists and organizations can engage with their relevant governments on the topic of transgender and gender diverse health, what has been the experiences of the trans community in different parts of the world regarding access to health, and we will discuss the SDG framework and how activists and advocacy organizations can engage to more, meaningful, more meaningfully with governments and government agencies and get uh, to buy in in their work and activists and advocacy organizations to advance in the 2030 agenda. So I want to first uh, introduce our first speaker, Liesl Terron. Liesl Terron is a South African human rights activist with a focus on LGBTI organizing. She now resides in Mexico and is a freelance consultant. Uh, Liesl will take us through the presentation of the different uh, documents that have been produced uh, in the last few weeks by Gate that you can find on our website. And if you have any questions, please put them down in the Q&A chat box, we will make sure to answer your questions during this session. Thank you. Liesl, go ahead. Good day. Um, I'm very delighted to be here and to share with everyone that is viewing this, uh, the um, work that we developed about the connections we can make between um, the sustainable development goals and trans and gender diverse activism. <clears throat> so I'm quickly going to share my screen. And um, oh, there's just one more button I have to press to make it full screen. Okay, there we go. Um, somehow. Okay, anyway, the first part was just the introduction and I don't want to go back, take us back now. So the sustainable development goals is linked to the 2030 agenda and um, all 193 member states signed on or adopt, adopted it. That is one of the greatest key points, actually, that we can make use of because all of the member states signed on. So we have a way to keep our governments um, accountable. And um, the slogan, the main slogan that is linked to um, the 2030 agenda that we will use a lot is also leave no one behind. So these slides will take us through how we can do that kind of like um, work and make sure that we really start having our own visibility and the voices of trans and gender diverse activists and also the needs that it can um, actually really go forward with that aim of by 2030. So uh, we basically have 10 years left, so we also really have to get on board. So um, one of the systems that is available is the voluntary national reviews, but also the um, documents that Erica mentioned that will be on, on the guide website go a little bit more in length into this, because I want to actually really get ahead with some of the next slides that um, really indicate to us how we can make linkages. So today we will speak specific about um, the sustainable development goal number three, and that is to ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages. That is broad, but we have to ensure that we actually are not left behind, that we really actually are part of that broad definition or goal. So that really um, will be our entry point. And um, here again, I will really go very quickly over this because all of the trans advocates, individuals or organizations that do work know by heart trans individuals. Everyone knows what are the additional health issues that trans and gender diverse people deal with besides the day-to-day -day healthcare, like when a person has common flu or whatever. So, and I just put it down in very short captions, for example, access to hormones, because we know there's a whole range 
of what happens. Um, and I'm sure some of our other panelists will speak more to that as well. Um, negligence of SRHR healthcare transition related and general healthcare that is denied due to identity documentation, stigma in the medical profession across all service providers. So what I mean here is obviously public, private, um, even clinics, uh, NGO related healthcare, and then again, also actually all points of entry, whether it is at a reception where you have to put your name down through to the nurses, the care takers, doctors, everyone. So we have that then unprofessional and uninformed healthcare providers and also mistreatment at mental health care facilities. And I want to actually highlight the mental health mistreatment out a little bit, obviously, because we know that sometimes so-called diagnosis or conditions get used against people. And additionally, because people have that position of power and can do that. So these are just uh, what I mentioned, some of the things, and uh, the list is longer. We all know that there are many other additional healthcare needs that trans and gender diverse people deal with. So the SDGs, all of them, there are 17 of them, and each, each SDG have targets. And also, um, we will go into the next slide to the, um, also the outcomes or the outputs, the indicators. But regarding the targets, there are a whole list for SDG 3. And remember, the SDGs were written for general population. So what we are doing here is to try and make it trans inclusive and look at the ones that is more um, applicable for us as entry points, so whether it is for um, policy papers, for dialogues with our governments, or for making submissions or whatever. So. We just highlighted out here the most obvious ones, but obviously people are diverse, so maybe they actually deal with many of the other um, targets as well in the SDG3. So the six targets that we highlighted out here is that by 2030, the AIDS epidemic um, will come to an end, including all the other ones listed there that are linked to um, the AIDS um, epidemics. At, tuberculosis, malaria, all of those, and other communicable diseases. Then also to um, the prevention and treatment and promote mental health and well-being. That is a key one again. <clears throat> Substance abuse, including narcotic drug and abuse and harmful use of alcohol. And we are able to make our linkages to all of these due to the work we are doing and due to some of the research that is out there already due to our own organizational programs if we have projects or programs regarding any of these <clears throat> universal access to sexual and reproductive health care services universal health coverage including the safe effective quality and affordable essential medicines and vaccines and then to strengthen the capacity of all countries in particular the developing the developing countries for early warning risk reduction and management of national and global health risks normally one would it wouldn't maybe necessarily link this to trans healthcare and um, gender diverse healthcare however this current pandemic that we are in showed us already in research that came out and organizations reporting, it shows us already that people that, that is the um, most marginalized, who are really on the peripheries of communities are anyway already most excluded. So for me, I really think that's why I bring in um, the target number 3D, because a current epidemic like this that has nothing to do, for example, with trans and gender, um, diverse people however they are some of the people that will be the most affected especially when you look at um, or apply an intersectional lens and you look at trans people that maybe sit in a migrant migration camp or trans people who are homeless so it really just escalates okay then there are the indicators i mentioned them and again, there are a whole list, many more than what is listed here, but I was feeling to highlight these ones out. Also, just to mention, um, you can literally in your search engine just type, type out sustainable development goals and it will appear. All the 17 goals and you can just look around. So, um, and the documents that will be on the guide website have more information. So I really just condensed it for this uh, purpose. Some of the indicators, and I will just highlight a few of them. 
but some of the indicators, for example, is to look then at um, treatment invent um, interventions for substance use disorders or a harmful use of alcohol, coverage of the essential healthcare services. So these targets or indicators are basically linked to the targets that I mentioned in the earlier slide. Another way how we can look at our own work, um, how to make the linkages of start doing or doing um, SDG work is look at, for example, um, SDG 3 and it's written out here basically what it stands about. And then look at which international human rights instruments that some of us are already aware of or can become aware, can use as entry points and link our language, link our work that we're currently already doing to the SDGs. Um, so we can look, for example, at making a, a CEDA um, shadow report or UPRs. So there are a huge amount of things that we can, and these are just beginning points. Once we start really getting into it, obviously there will um, be many more ways of how we can deal with SDGs. So then I have um, in the um, reports that is listed on the website, I, I, we what we did is we um, organized it in two ways. There are some organizations that are already familiar with um, work on the UN level that already do some of the work that, um, well, in the times before COVID and the no, non-traveling that were going to Geneva and uh, do this type of work. So for those organizations that already do the work, they could then consider when they make their submissions to link their own work to the Committee of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. This is now in connection with SDG 3 or to the Special Rapporteur on Health. And a very obvious one is to every time your country come up for UPRs to make a, um, a, a review and in the spotlight reports. It's important also for us who are dealing with this work already and for the ones that want to start learning and engaging with the work to become familiar with the language because we also need to know whenever it is our country's time to have a review be up to date because usually very quickly after the reviews, it appears on the UN website. And then thereafter, you can also see to what did your country agree. And that is the points where we have to keep our um, governments accountable. Because um, it is one thing to make promises when the world's eye is on you. And what do they do when they come back home? That is where our work really sits. And here is um, a slide to show what recommendations we um, can think of, you know, when we made a, a list um, that organizations can do who are not yet working, they work in line with SDGs or don't that who, who don't list or link it already. But there are ways to do that work, even if you your organization's mission and vision or your intention or your capacity is never to actually go in to Geneva or to make submissions, but there are ways how we can link our work. The importance of linking our work of the importance of using this language and all of that come all back to holding our government accountable. And if we are familiar with this work, we can speak the language that they signed on to. So <clears throat> Some of the examples, for example, is to do advocacy um, with focus on gender markers. Some of these reasons, uh, there will be organizations that are already very familiar with it and do it. And it makes sense to a lot of us because we see over and over how trans people are excluded from basically every facet of life if they don't have their gender markers aligned to um, how they need it to be. <clears throat> and health is one of the very big ones. So in general, if organizations can engage in that work or support their community members who want to um, access it, whichever way the organization is set up, but that is important for us to do. <clears throat> to expand our organizational knowledge, both on what is the real needs of our community and how to link those to the SDGs <clears throat> by means of language. Then um, to ensure that the organizations pay particular attention to the impact of intersectional oppression on the socioeconomic well-being of trans people. And again, because we know how socioeconomic is linked to health. And um, 
the moment we speak of intersectional oppression, we know that uh, oppression uh, is escalates as well. Then identify which organizations in your country are already addressing SDGs and form alliances with them. Be allies with them, even if it's not your usual um, colleagues or the NGOs in, let's say in your country have a national um, task force or network or whatever, only in the trans um, or only in LGBT. Move beyond that, look at what organizations in the ch children's sector or in the sector with uh, working with people with disabilities. There are many other human rights sectors that we can find alliances with, because whenever we then have allies and speak up in a room, we have people that stand up with us and agree with us and motions can go forward that way. <clears throat> Here are some more um, recommendations. And again, what I think one of the most important takeaways here is that this whole effort is not to tell all organizations, put down the work you are doing and only do SDG work, not at all. It is literally a case of look at the 17 SDGs. Basically every human rights organization in, in the broadest definition and therefore, uh, therefore by um, default as well, trans and gender diverse organizations, everyone will touch at least at a few of the SDGs. So it is really just a case of look at what are those SDGs and look at your own mission, vision, your programs and see what linkages can be made. It can be possible that one organization only work in the area of SDG 1, 3, 8 or 11. 8 is for example, the one that includes um, employment issues. And we know that we do um, work in that field as well. Or um, SDG 11 includes housing accommodation. <clears throat> so you don't have to work on all 17 SDGs, even if you just work on one, but link your work by description to that. That start giving you that language. Um, get onto the board of your country's HIV or National AIDS Commission because that is in that room where you start making more allies and where you can really start have engagement in what is the policies that your government want to put forward or uh, what is the reports they are putting out there and hold them accountable. The leave no one behind phrase is literally your justification because all 193 member states signed on to the agenda 2030. It might be a case that your government actually um, have a different policy, a different outlook, but this is the land which we can start using. Then empower all trans organizations, your own, and if you have ally organizations, if your country have more than one, the organizations, the staff, the board members, everyone, with strategies to hold the government accountable, and this can be on municipal level, local level, provincial level, national level, any way possible that is in the reach of your organization. And then um, include regular discussion points in your IGMs, in your um, annual reports, in your organizational newsletters, those linkages that you made start subtly use that language because it starts giving everyone the information about that, that when it happens, let's say there's a um, pre-elections campaign and the municipal member came to speak, you know, in the community then everyone are equipped with the correct language and can actually start asking the questions in line with things that your government signed on for. And that will start a dialogue. So that is me. And um, I will stop sharing my screen. There are ways how to get hold of me or also contact Gate if anyone wants to engage with me. So thank you for that. I know it was a lot of information, but, and I, talk fast, but therefore it will be more detailed on the website. Thank you very much, Liesl, for that amazing presentation and for giving an introduction to SDG3 and the work around uh, human rights, health, universal health access, and how it relates to transgender people. Um, and today with us, we have three as uh, panelists who will be talking about their experiences in their organizations, in their daily lives, about the access to health in the trans community. And I'm, I'm going to introduce them to you. We have Michelle, who is the founder and director of Clinic U, 
uh, Michelle is a psychotherapist involved in HIV for, for 33 years. Uh, also with us is Cecilia. Cecilia works at Transgender Lab Center as Senior Director for Strategic Initiatives and is also a member of the WHO uh, Women Living with HIV Advisory Group. And finally, we have Max. Max is the coordinator of the International Trans Men and HIV Working Group who resides in Germany and is fabulous. So welcome everybody to this conversation. And we're gonna start uh, you know, with a question uh, for all the panelists to answer. Uh, what has been your experience of dealing with access to healthcare for the trans community? So let's start with Cecilia. Okay, so um, let me preface by saying that um, I live in one of the high income country, which is the United States. And, um, and sadly, even for um, high income countries such as um, United States, we continue to face um, lots of barriers, not just from providers themselves, but also um, with lawmakers who are trying to pass oppressive laws, you know, to um, bar us from accessing the healthcare um, services that we that are essential to us. Um, the example I can give you um, is, for instance, you know, like there are different states right now who are contemplating passing um, bills to um, to look at um, providing transgender healthcare to um, youth and adolescents as a form of child abuse by the parents. And so, you know, like that is um, very stigmatizing and also like really discourage, you know, like parents to support their, um, their children, you know, um, appropriately. So other things that, you know, are happening, for instance, you know, like we, we sign on to a lot of different things, you know, like as members of um, the UN, but, you know, like, but do we actually walk that walk and practice that? Um, that's debatable um, because, you know, like we continue to have government trying to take away um, our, our rights, you know, like by um, not uh, allowing us to access, you know, the appropriate um, facilities, housings, and shelters. So these are all tied back to, you know, like the well-being of transgender people. Um, and while there are some progress, I must say, you know, like um, in some different states, you know, like they also have like passed um, bills to make sure that the protection is, um, is enshrined into um, the state laws. Um, but unfortunately, you know, like when we look at the country as a whole, we still have a lot of work that we need to do. Thank you very much, Cecilia. And you touch on something that frequently comes up in questions. Um, you shared uh, that it is very common that countries sign UN declarations, international treaties. Most countries do that. But in the follow-up and in the implementation of those uh, treaties, of those declarations, it, there's a disconnection. So as an activist, what can one do when that happens? Okay, so I think that there are two things here. You know, like one is like, what is the point of these declarations if nobody actually um, are enforcing them and monitoring them? Um, and the other is, you know, like if you look at even with the SDGs, you know, like the key word is not the SDG, it's the voluntary part of it. So when something's voluntary, then, you know, it means that, you know, like it is not binding. They don't have to be um, enforced or implemented, you know, like, and like, while it sounds great, you know, that we have all these goals, you know, like, and, um, and high aspirations, um, but none of that actually benefit people unless they are being implemented. Um, and like Lisa have listed out, you know, like the list of like STG goals. So they all connected, you know, like, and that's, that's the part that we have to also recognize, you know, like we cannot be mistreating migrants, you know, especially, you know, like when we look at um, US treatment to trans migrants, you know, like we have several trans people living with HIV who had died 
in detention facilities while they're trying to seek for asylum. Um, so those are very inhumane approach. Um, and definitely, I don't think that 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 is like what the human rights framework has in mind. Um, and, you know, of course, you know, um, for the SDGs, you know, like, it's, you know, it's totally like that's cognitive dissonance, um, like working actually against what they have um, signed as a pledge and commit to. So I think that it's really important um, for us to be able to, um, Lisa mentioned the, um, the shadow report and also, you know, like the review. Sometimes, however, I think that those those mechanisms are great to call people out, but it doesn't really like improve lives of people in general. Cause like we've been doing this for years after years, you know, and we still don't see the resources necessary, you know, like to reverse the harm that is um, brought upon to the communities. So we really need to build a broader coalitions and hold our um, our government accountable to what they have signed for. Like don't sign something if you don't really mean to like make it happen in your own country. So that's just my personal view. Thank you very much, Cecilia. And uh, uh, Michelle, you know, in you, we know that you're the founder and director of Clinic Q, which provides services mm -hmm. for the trans community in, um, in, in your country. Can you tell us how has that experience been about the access to health for trans people? What difference has Clinic U made and what challenges remain? Yeah, um, it was really, before I thought, it was really interesting to hear Cecilia talk as well, because you know, as you know, in the UK, we have an NHS service and it's really important, but there are not many issues that I will talk about. Well, Clinic here, um, we started with no funding and we still have very little funding. Nine years of delivering really important services that have influenced many of the organisations in changing and inclusion of trans people. And, and that's been really important as well. We've, we've gone around the UK training organisations, training the NHS, and at one time we get, didn't get paid for that training, but then we thought, hang on, there's, we can get funding here for this training. So we can then put that funding into providing services for our community, because that was our objective, to provide services that not just inclusive, but were informed, that were data inclusive, that were many other in issues around HIV, around um, well-being. And, and so, I think, no, well, I kind of know that we did influence many other organizations. And sometimes I think, well, what's changed? Well, actually in nine years, things have changed in the UK. It's still a lot of work to do. And, um, you know, there's um, now three pilot studies on gender care services uh, that are hoping to look at doing it differently to the gender identity clinics that have up to three, four years waiting and, you know, a year or two years before you even get your first appointment. And the impact on mental health and well-being of those times with no hormones because the gender identity services have to tell the GPs to prescribe hormones. And GPs are very reluctant to prescribe hormones without that sign off without that okay. And yet waiting four years when someone's made that decision, knowing that this is the way that they have to go forward can be really traumatic and actually impacts on the mental health in a very negative way. And we're not there as a stop grab for that, but we do support a lot of people going through that process. We have 11, we just interviewed three more therapists. We've got 12 therapists delivering our service and we're full out. We have got, I want to talk about something that happened in the UK, a law that was just passed around young people, but I will just continue with this. Um, we have recently got some COVID funding. We struggle as an organisation with a track record of showing what we can do, 
we traveled around the world delivering and speaking at um, especially international AIDS conferences. Um, we still, because we're a trans organization, so we're trans led, to get the funding, the core funding, the development funding that we need to progress, really. And um, so, you know, it, it, it has been a struggle, it is still a struggle um, in that area because it, it limits us and we know we can do so much more with that funding. If we were a part of, we do have lots of allies, we have lots of connections um, with other organisations, that's always been important. And I'm talking about LGBT and other organisations, government organisations. But, um, you know, if we were in, if we were in an LGBT organisation, we wouldn't have so much trouble getting funding. But it's important for us at Clinic Q as trans people, that we can show our power, that we can, I use that term loosely, but it, it's important for our, us and our community to say, well, we can do this, so can you. But it's a struggle. However, we have um, been involved in the HIV Commission. We were, I was on the advisory board as Clinicu to the um, HIV Commission ending HIV by um, 30, 2030. And as well as um, we worked with Public Health England to get the first ever data on trans people living with HIV in the UK from 2015 to now. Before that, there was in a high income country, there was no data, no details on people living with HIV. And actually, we can't record the beyond past 2015. So we know there's a lot of hidden figures. So the reporting system, HIV and AIDS reporting system, is done in the clinics where people access their HIV medication. And um, we, they worked with Public Health England to do that, but also with Positive Voices, which once we had the data, it showed a lot, as you know, data pulls out a lot. It's not just chasing numbers. It shows out a lot of the issues. It shows com in comparison to cisgender people on H and HIV meds and living with HIV and, and accessing services as a person living with HIV. There's still a lot of work to do on that, but that those are really important that I feel I need to mention. So there are changes, but there's still a lot that as a struggle, there's a big attack as there is in around the world on our rights as trans people. And recently there was a, um, well, it's a law really, that people under 16 cannot, trans people under 16 can now not be prescribed blockers, puberty blockers, without going to um, a court order first and getting the okay to do that. Not by the clinicians. The clinicians cannot just prescribe it as they were doing and they had to stop. Once that was passed, they had to stop and these thousands of young people who had been receiving the blockers or hoping to receive them trauma traumatized. And that that is such an infringement on civil liberties, on such an you know there, there's sort of such a lot of anger about this. Um, there's a lot of organizations who are trans who are responding to this, who are doing a lot of good work um, to try and bring changes. And the Gender Recognition Act, rather than the self-declaration, de um, it has to go in front of a panel, it, it has to fill in lots of documentation that lot, a lot of trans people have, necessarily. Um, think about, you know, migrants, or th well, actually migrants can't get it un unless they become a British citizen. But, um, Think about in many situations where people don't keep their history of documentation, that they have to prove who they are and how long they've been living who's, who they are. So there's many issues, but I, I want to say things have changed or started to change. Otherwise, it feels like our work has had no impact. Thank you very much, Michelle. And you mentioned, you know, this important data that 
tracks uh, since 2015 uh, uh, the numbers and situation of trans people living with HIV. Hmm. Can you share very briefly what difference will this data do for transgender people? And will this have any trickling effect beyond HIV in broader health issues for trans people? Well, I hope so, Erica. I hope it has a broader effect. And I, you know, and I'll do my best, uh, at Clinic Q rather, we will do our best to make sure, and other organizations will do the best to make sure that happens. But until there's inclusive data, say, with, throughout the NHS, the NHS has a binary system, male, female, and there sometimes is a box of for other and maybe transgender, but that cannot necessarily feed in to the many issues of health, access to health, informed services within the NHS. The wonderful service that is a bit overwhelmed with COVID at the moment, but it is, and I know a lot of people who work in the NHS, solid working people who back us as well, really support us. In fact, we're in partnership with King's College Hospital, which is an NHS huge um, uh, trust, it's a trust. So um, I think until that data filters into all the health services within the NHS, then how does that change things? How can the, the findings through, um, through the collection of HIV data that we now have filter into that? I'm not sure yet. I hope it does, and I hope it can. And um, we have a brilliant doctor who's a national advisor to uh, LGBT health in the UK, and he's our doctor at Clinic U, and his, work, his name is Dr. Michael Brady. And he's really working hard to make those changes throughout the NHS, but not only the NHS, through all, uh, lots of other services. Um, you know, non-government organizations. Perfect, that sounds really promising and do keep us updated how it goes. We will be very um, eager to hear from you and, and you know, maybe take this as hopefully okay. be able to replicate in other countries where there's complete absence of data around trans people, not only in HIV, in all areas of health. <laughs> So, you know, and, and talking about, you know, this absence of data, you know, Max, we're really interested in hearing from you about your experience of accessing health for the uh, trans masculine community. Um, yeah, I mean, like the, the problems that were mentioned, I think that are kind of like accountable for, for the whole community. But at the same time, I know that um, trans masculine and female assigned at birth non-binary people, like we have been left out of health discussions and health decision making for like forever, basically. Like we have never been included properly, specifically around HIV and HIV prevention. There mm -hmm. is a huge lack of data. It's not really clear um, what, you know, what, what, like we as our community we know what our needs are uh, and maybe also like where our risks um, uh, are in, in terms of like accessing healthcare but like healthcare providers are just ignorant and are not inclusive um, of like or not they're not properly taking care of us and I mean this was also mentioned before by Cecilia you know like I live in the global north country in Germany and I, I keep saying like you know like during a global pandemic, I feel relatively safe in Germany. Like I know if I, you know, catch the virus, if I have to go to the hospital, I will be taken care of like in a way, but like this healthcare system that we have here in Germany fails me as a trans person on a daily life basis. Mm -hmm. And this is where the problem lays within that. I just like my general healthcare, um, like I would say, no matter if I'm trans masculine or trans female or non-binary, um, the system is not ready for us there is a lack of knowledge like specifically you know like I I, I was born like I was female assigned at birth I did not undergo um, gender um, affirming genital surgery so I have to get regular um, checkups with the gynecologist and usually you know like it's a situation that is uncomfortable for everyone just like laying somewhere with your legs spread wide in front of someone yeah. that you basically don't know um, that is an uncomfortable situation for everyone. But if it, like, if you are a trans masculine person and if you are sitting there, you have not studied medicine and you in that situation, while someone is looking up, you know, into your private parts, uh, you need to explain to them. So I take testosterone and this is what's happening inside my body. And you need to be aware of X, Y, Z. And you should know that this and this and this and that is happening inside my body because of the hormones that I take. Um, and then they look at you and you're like, and they're like, 
oh, I didn't know. And I'm like, yeah, I know that you didn't know. That's why I'm telling you. And this is the problem that the medical professionals, they don't know what's happening inside our bodies because of the lack of knowledge. We are not being treated right. We're often also mistreated that only on a physical medical level, but then there comes also the mistreatment on a social level, level that we're we're yeah. being discriminated against, that we are not being um, called by the right names, by the right pronouns, that there is no bathrooms in the medical, like if I go to my gynecologist, there's only a women's restroom. So I'm like, where should I go and pee? You know, it's like, <laughs> this is like, people don't think even that far that we need to, that we actually need to use these places. Or for me in Berlin, if I, like I had it that I had to take, I had to have a biopsy done and I had to walk like into the women's clinic. And I'm like, you know, this is not, the name is already so exclusive um, that I don't want to go in. And a lot of my, I know that a lot of my trans siblings, they don't, they just don't do these preventive healthcare checkups because of the reasons that I mentioned. And then, you know, like having, for example, cervical cancer um, recognized too late, that is a, that's a real threat for my community and that is only one example and there's like multiple others where the system is failing us and we need we need to be taken better care of and providers need to be receiving more information medical students need to be receiving more information or at least get the information where they can go to find more information if they're interested because that's the problem that the information is basically non-existent and we like that's also like, that's probably where we have to start to generate more knowledge and then make sure it's being disseminated in a, in a proper way. And yeah. Thank you very much, Max. You mentioned both biomedical and social barriers to being able to access quality health services. What do you think is the root cause for these barriers? The root is basically like, a cis normative system of like thinking about bodies not being able to to look beyond these these like the, the gender binary um and you know i keep saying like whatever we do you know like even there is no such thing as a male body or a female body there are certain characteristics that occur more often in certain types of combinations like chromosomes, uh, genitals, um, whatever, facial hair and so on. Like that there is some sort of, you know, I don't, I don't wanna talk away that there is some similarities, but if we just look around us, like no person, no body looks like another body. You know, it's like, we're all so different. We're all like, you know, diverse in our, in our ways and having a different, like a, a, like a diversity embracing look on bodies and the phys like physics of people is not only something that benefits the trans community, it benefits basically everyone. It benefits like, you know, the, 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 the wider, wider uh, mainstream society. And this is something where we need to go to like to have like to embrace diversity and to make sure that we look at everybody individually with their needs and whatever little packages they bring to the table, you know, like everyone comes with a different history, everyone comes with different, different problems, different, you know, um, trauma, whatever it is. Um, not only trans people, like we are suffering most because of this oppressive system that only embraces like uh, cis normativity. But at the same time, as I said, at the end of the day, um, everyone, everyone will have a benefit if we if we just look a little beyond uh, these the, the gender binary. Thank you very much, uh, Max. And I just want to uh, remind our viewers, if you have any questions for Liesl, Cecilia, Michelle or Max, just type it in in the Q&A box and we'll be happy to answer your questions live. You know, it, throughout this discussion and right now around the world with the issues of COVID, there are two boss terms that everybody is speaking about. And I want to get each and every one of you's input. Like really short, what is your input? What is your thinking about these terms? And those terms are global health security and universal health access. Two words that every health institution around the world is using at the moment. Everybody is talking about we need to be prepared for future pandemics and they're using global health security even to move funding from human rights work into PPE, oxygen and uh, pandemic preparedness. So I want to get your points of view around these two terms. And, you know, let's start with Michelle this time. Global health security and universal health coverage. You know, I don't even know yeah. where. Sorry, yeah, I don't even know where to start with that, because 
you know, it just feels huge and global. And I feel stunted here by being able to articulate the real issues and the real needs. I don't know how that applies to trans, non-binary and gender diverse people. I just don't, perhaps I'm not the one to ask first, but I just want to say something that Max was saying, and I hope you don't mind, and I'm not coming away from what you just asked me, Erica. Um, just to say, from the very start of Clinic Q, <clears throat> it was so, nine years ago, so important to have a clinic where people came to have the issues that Max was talking about, about smears and, and screening for trans masculine people. Absolutely, and it's a big part of what we do. And yet still, exactly what Max is saying and experiencing happens in other parts of the health service. People are having a terrible time around those issues and it really needs to change. Thank you very much, Michelle. So, um, let me come back to you on the question oh. that you asked me because it stumps me. No problem. Go ahead, Max. You're muted. No, I think I, I thought uh, Michelle wanted to uh, wanted to continue, wanted to say more. She's going to come back. After. I'll come back in a moment. Okay. Um, can wait a second. Can you say the Can you say the question again? Sorry. Global health like security, just, global ah, health yeah, security yeah. and universal health coverage. What's yeah, the first I mean, things that come to your mind when you hear that? Um, the first thing that comes to my mind when I hear that is basically that I that, like I think whatever it is, uh, it will not be inclusive of us because like it's mostly done by by cis you know by cis people and um, they won't be thinking of us if we're not being included in any type of that discussion on like a national, international, regional, wherever like on all levels that these discussions are happening like nothing nothing's gonna happen you know like nothing's gonna gonna affect our community positively if we're not sitting at the table to discuss these things with others and with every other stakeholder so um, that is the first thing that comes to my mind obviously it would be nice to have health coverage universal health care for everyone but I know the way the discussions are being made at the moment, nothing's going to change for us. Thank you, Max. Cecilia? Um, I agree with both like Michelle and Max, you know, like this is just like empty promises and empty words, you know, like if there are no resources um, and there are no actual values and principles add to these terms, they mean nothing to the trans community, you know, like, and you can have universal health access, but is it gender affirming? Like you can have like um, global health security, but does that mean that, you know, like you are going to like increase surveillance rather than, you know, like really looking at how to like in, invest in preventative measure um, for, for health, like, like you know, all the vaccine and um, and other preventive um, treatment. So, so again, you know, like there are so many different ways to look at this. You know, like but one thing that's for sure, until we actually know um, more data how things impact the community, we won't even know how to like allocate money. So moving one part of money to another part of money seems like a little bit premature in my words, and also um, like when your care doesn't really affirm who you are, like for people to continue to seek healthcare, you know, in that setting, it's very disparaging. And I think that, um, you know, like that trust have not really been built, you know, in majority of the world. Um, and, you know, it needs to start there first, you know, like build trust, and also control the costs of like um, of like med medical services and you know and medications. So like until we know how to control that cost, you know, like we can say a lot of things, you know, about like everyone should get cares, nobody should be left behind, you know, like and you know, but in reality, we're doing exactly the opposite. Thank you, Cecilia. And I wonder if Michelle or Lizzo. Do you want to add anything to this discussion about global health security and universal health coverage? 
I think what I can add is basically just literally emphasize what Cecilia said. <laughs> Because number one, um, if it and what Max actually what everyone said, because if it is designed by the system, it literally will not mean nothing for trans. So we, we see it already. This um, documents that I was uh, working on, it's very novel to say leave no one behind. But already for just since that exists in 2015, but I mean the concept is there since ever. But since it is in writing in 2015 until 20. 20, which is five years, it didn't do anything. So this uh, global health security is obviously almost like a knee-jerk reaction now to the um, pandemic. And um, I'm scared like it will be done, whatever new policies or framing of it will be done in a rush, again by the system. And what will it do to the homeless trans person? To the majority of trans people that cannot access services to change the documentation. If we look at how, for example, in, in the handling of the pandemic, there were certain countries that literally had the lockdowns and curfews some days by, by gender, by men and women can go out to shops or not. So if that is the type of mindset, how global health security will also be framed or defined or whatever you call it, be worked out those policies with no trans and gender diverse activists around the table to also say the opinion and get the realities on paper. And we all know what is on paper is anyway not even completely implemented always. So yes, um, <laughs> let me not continue. Let's give more time to other people as well. But I don't know if a rush in those type of things will do anything for the trans community. So there's oh. some, go ahead, Michelle. Oh, thank you. Well, I only want to say, I just, um, I feel really intense and I'm trying to stay calm, but my body is kind of feeling really intense because um, everything that Celia said, at least, and, and Max said, if we are not designing the system, if we're not in sitting at the table, doing the designing with us because in a way when they don't do it with us they leave us behind they don't you know exactly how can they do this and you know and I'm and I've got many cis white friends but usually the power's in cis white people's hands thank you so we have some uh, questions and comments uh from uh, participants uh, who, who are viewing um, the webinar. So there's this comment about the situation in Sweden, um, which is specifically severe in regards to healthcare. There are clinics going out of their way to delay waiting times, performing conversion therapy, et cetera. And I think many countries have had the experience of waiting times for surgeries, for gender care, extremely delayed. So I wonder if any of you, uh, the panelists, want to uh, have some comments uh, for the uh, for the viewer, but also they want to know what's being done to to work around these issues. And then the other question is, how do we tackle the emerging situation whereby health security is being used by our health departments and governments to deprioritize our universal healthcare needs, and in broader terms other holistic human rights. So anybody who would like to, to comment or answer. Um, I'll answer the second one, um, Jenny's questions on the holistic human rights. And I think that that's, that's a great question, you know, and, and like I mentioned earlier, you know, like you can have healthcare, but is it necessarily gender affirming? So in the US, you know, like we are like using new terminologies as well, you know, like one of them is whole person care, you know, it's not just the physical health that we need to take care of. It's also the emotional, the mental, and also, you know, like the, um, the spiritual health. So, so in order to do that, you know, like we have to to be able to create some check and balances and infrastructures, you know, like so that we prioritize um, healing, you know, as one of the like 
principles in all our work. You know, and you know, I think that globally we are um, adopting terms like trauma informed. You know, like and which means that we need to recognize everyone has a different way of looking at their own healthcare. You know, like some trust the systems, some don't. You know, and we have to start there. You know, how to help people build that trust. And if somebody already have a trust, how can we actually help them to improve their quality of life? So there is a continuum that we're working in, you know, in terms of holistic and whole person care. And, you know, and that ties, you know, like it ties into what like holistic human rights are. Um, so, so I think that, you know, those are the things that we need to make sure, like if our governments are not doing it, you know, like I think that we need to come together and give them a checklist, you know, like, and so it's great that they have all these different agenda, but let's not forget, we should be setting our own agendas. Okay. Absolutely, Cecilia, absolutely. You know, and I've approached many like public health things, I approached them about the lack of data on HIV. I didn't expect them to know how to do it. I went with a plan. I showed them what we were doing at Clinic Q already. And I showed them also the Centre of Excellence of Trans Health Care in San Francisco, what they've been doing for years. And so, because they don't often know what to do and how to do it. So I think we need to go armed, well, not we, people need to go armed with a plan of this showing people this is what you can do this is what's been done and um because people are often lost in knowing what to do and then if they try they often don't get it right because people and trans and gender diverse people are not at the table however did um erica you mentioned something about um conversion therapy did you or did i yes yeah, so yeah um... okay as a psychotherapist you know who's worked in not only in HIV, but many areas, um, it, mental health has always been an important part of what we do at Clinic Q. Absolutely. It's one of our main access services. And online, it's accessed across the UK now, where mainly before we were just in London. Um, we're also a part of professional body, the British Psychological Society, who are bringing, a, who have brought a campaign to um, stop conversion therapy and to all and as it applies to trans people um, and that's a really I guess do people know about this one no okay so um, it's really important that um, we are part of that we are at the table with that one Thank you very much, Michelle and Max. Uh, we, we're running out, uh, out of time, but can you please, I would like you to concentrate maybe if your knowledge of, of, or you have experience in countries delaying service and particularly, you know, the clarification of you know, sometimes delaying that service that seems on purpose and, and malicious delay of services. So, uh, you know, what can be done or, or is, have other countries been able to do something? Um, I mean, we're experiencing something similar in Germany right now that uh, they're reintroducing like the everyday life experience that you have to prove for a certain period of time that you're X, Y, like that you're either male or female. There's also not other, any other option in order to receive hormones. Um, they banned that, but as I said, reintroduced it recently. So, um, but what I would say like in any kind of way, because like I know that the system right now, the way it is, it doesn't take care of us. So what we need to do is to take care of, care of ourselves. That means we need to, you know, like empower and build capacity of our community that actually that, that we have, you know, like healthcare providers that can prescribe hormones for us, that we have uh, therapists that can help us with, you know, whatever documentation paperwork that we need in order to prove to someone that we're trans or whatever else is needed, that we get that without these barriers and that we also, we, we're dependent, we're dependent on cis allies, you know, that we go and let's say, like, couldn't convince some like allies to help us to, to support us in that way. And I think this is the way we need to go that we actually need to change the system somehow from within, um, as I said, to, to build capacity in our community to professionalize us. And there is already Already, you know, in, in many countries, there are already trans professionals in healthcare settings and therapy and whatever. And we just need 
to have many, many more of that. And I know it's harder for us to reach certain positions and to get education, to get through an educational system that also discriminates us against us. But we still, you know, like we, we're still here, we're still standing and um, having these webinars and like connecting globally. I think that is, that is the powerful structure um, that we need to build or need to continue building in order to just, you know, like get us the care that we need, but like we need to do it. I don't want to say like all by ourselves, but um, I think that is something to invest some energy um, to, to build structures for trans people by trans people. Definitely. Thank you very much, uh, Max. And also, you know, if, if somebody wants to contact us, we, I shared an email there uh, to contact us at GATE. We can do everything possible to share other similar experience of other countries, what other countries are doing, or put you in contact with other organizations that are doing the same kind of work or have been able to address these issues. So please feel free to contact us. We'll make sure we answer any of your questions or requests for information or, or, or um, contacting you with the right persons who can give you better answers, more concrete examples of what is being done. So we will be more than happy to. I hope that you found the information and the discussion helpful. I want to talk our, thank our panelists, Cecilia, Michelle, Max, and Lizel for your kind, your words and, and, and your input into this session. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great day, evening, morning, wherever you are.